Hi, everyone who will watch this by recording. Today is the 18th of April, 2017. It's a very big topic. It is preparing for your final events, or if you're in Europe, your Viva. What is that? That's a committee full of people who don't know you, who don't know your work, and who have um, their own um, administrative hats on. So some of them will be uh, supported by your university really to ensure that nobody gets through who doesn't deserve it. Others will be paid for by your university for their time and they will be what's called an outside examiner. That's because uh, we, it's a peer review issue. Uh, we want to have somebody who has no Uh, I do that for universities, um, and so I'll tell you as we go through this what how those setups look from the other side of the desk. Um, and, oh, maybe try uploading the slides to a handouts folder here on Big Marker. Adrian, I just wish I could clone you. You are always full of good advice. Let me, um, let me do that. I will. Follow Adrian's example. Is there a handouts folder already? No, I don't. Is there one, Adrian? Sorry, everybody. We got a little sidetracked by the question um, from people in the room prior to the time I started of how they were going to get the the notes from this. And the reason that you will want the slides from this is that the second week after the um, after the exercise that I have you all do at the end of this one, the next week we'll go through the questions you'll get asked and you'll, you'll want, these are slides you'll probably go back to as the time goes on. So there is a handouts folder in Big Marker and we will put the slides in it. Does that work for everybody? I hope so. Chat, people, poll, question handouts. You know, I wish more people took the time you take, Adrian to um, help to see all that a tool does. Um, you have exceptional skills that way. And uh, I certainly use them for my benefit all the time. But think about it as uh, in terms of future employment as well. Because if you're working for, one of the things we're working on here around, and I'll get back to my topic in a second. One of the things we're working on here at Doctoral Net is transferable skills of PhDs to non-academic places. And um, the ability to look at things over a broad view, coalesce it, sort it, and move it on like you have to to finish this um, is a very good skill and uh, very good for your future job opportunities. But that's a, a more later kind of thing. All right, let's get started on surviving this task that will get you out of here and on to being a doctor. I like to start with quotes, as you know, and I'm going to read two today. I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sail to always reach my destination. And the more you know about your destination, which is getting past this committee, through whatever they require of you, and on to graduation, the better. And one of the things that we'll discuss next week, or two weeks, I guess it is, whenever the next second one is scheduled, um, I guess it is next Tuesday, uh, what, when, what we will discuss then is backwards mapping from graduation to a pre-viva stage. Because it isn't just the defense or the viva, it is the end game after that that gets you to graduation. So just to keep that in mind, you may, especially those of you who are going to defend quickly, you may be thinking like, this is it. Well, this is not it. This is a big milestone, but it comes later. And al along that line, this is very important. Ambition, your personal ambition, is your path to success, no question about it, but persistence is the vehicle you arrive in. And I think um, you are all persistent people. Your, 
you've gotten here. I'm I'm just incredibly proud of all of you because I don't know all your personal stories, but I know that every single one of you has been up against some things on this journey that have really felt like a setback at the time, and yet you're here. So congratulations on that. Hold on to your persistence because it's going to take you through the end game, and the end game has its own set of difficulties. Let's talk about those. Our greatest weakness lives in giving up. The, mo the most certain way to succeed is always to just try one more time. And sometimes when you're throwing in your documents for review, if you have a committee member or a, people call this role different things in different parts of the world. So you may have an advisor, you may have a supervisor, you may have a committee chair. This person who knows you best may or may not actually be on the committee that you defend in front of. Uh, in Ireland, the person is called the supervisor more often. They supervise the research. They can be in the room with you, but they can't actually, and they can take notes for you, but they can't actually say anything. In the United States, it's frequently true that the committee chair has been your chair all the way along. And uh, they also manage this meeting. Uh, and, but yet, still at this meeting, there will be people who don't know you. And it is their voice in the committee that must be, that has the strongest weight. So um, before I get into the agenda, let me just help you look at those people in front of you. Uh, you may have somebody who that knows you. You may have an expert in your field. And so you're playing to them about your expertise in the content area. Uh, you may have people who know your methodology, and so you're playing to them that you, in fact, did it well, um, that your study is significant and reliable. Uh, of course, it's going to be well written. Of course, you will have passed through those hoops. And then you have an outside examiner, and that person will be looking to some general rules. So we'll talk about those. How are we going to get there? Two parts. The part today goes through the variations in the final parts of the journey across the different parts of the world, how dissertations or thesis are evaluated, some, some conversation about examination standards, and uh, a few little topics about what there's some tools on the doctoral net website, which I think you want to keep in mind. And then we're going to close with an exercise. We'll go on next week and we'll talk about, uh, and actually if it's, if you're defending next Wednesday or Thursday, you're still good because it's next Tuesday. We'll go on and we'll talk about what your quest, what questions you're likely to get answered, um, what, you know, the specifics of it, what your slides should look like, what the questions should look like, how you answer questions, how you deal with defensiveness, what, how you backwards map from the end game, et cetera. So I think it's a pretty solid two weeks, uh, and I'm happy to do this. Okay. I've talked a little bit about this slide. That you have different roles. Oftentimes, you're given some kind of a time period to do a presentation. Now, how long these things last is another thing that varies in different parts of the world. Uh, Europeans tend to talk more, be slower, be perfectly happy to do a two-hour experience. Uh, people in the U.S. might be more likely to make it an hour, hour and a half, um, or an hour that you're involved in, then another half an hour they talk about it, and then you come back and you know. Um, allowed or suggested to do for a presentation. I'll go through those more specifically next week. Um, and then then you go through an examination, and it's an oral examination. And the reason the word defense is what it's used in the United States is because that's what you're doing. You are defending your ideas in front of your peers, because if you pass this, you are a doctor, and you will leave this Face, in most cases, uh, with somebody saying, congratulations, you're Dr. So-and-so. So it's the last step to becoming the peer. And, and really, what they are doing is they're asking you questions. 
assuming they think you're worthy and that your work is worthy, then they're asking you questions as much out of curiosity as anything else, and they expect you to be able to answer those questions. So we'll talk about how to go through the question and answer part next week. But for you to get the idea that this is not like a test, it is not like an oral examination, or at least it shouldn't be, not to say that you can't have people in the room who make it more like that, but um, it really is a conversation where you, as an expert, defend why you did it that way and what you learned from it. And as long as you have reasonable answers that are within the right sense of reliable, et cetera, you'll You'll do fine. So let's all think about that in terms of you will do fine. Um, and then I've talked about some other uh, differences in terms of how formal or not formal it is. I think that's probably enough. There are, in some areas, there are standards that are strict protocols. Your university may have even a rubric of examination where, um, so I did one in for university in South Africa. They sent me the document, and then they sent me this rubric, and the rubric had the different aspects of the document and how I was supposed to rate them. And the advantage to a university doing it that way to them is that they can have examiners who really don't know all that much about, haven't done it that many times, let's put it that way. So it reminds them of how to look at each section about so it goes along in a certain way. And I'll go through that in detail in a minute. Um, the Some universities just basically bring you in, you sit you down, and then you do what you do. And so depending on who your examiners are, you may have a different level of expertise in the room about how they look at this. I'm going to take you through it today in a really detailed examination fashion, like I look at them. And I think I'll be as tough as most people will be. Uh, and so it'll give you a sense of the bar you're shooting for. Uh, and however they are, and however good they are, their votes are final. All right. so. What's unacceptable? This, I want to tell you, is from the research of Barbara Lovett. Barbara was one of the first people, 15 years old now, but Barbara was one of the first people to look at this question of how are dissertations and thesis around the world scored? Are there similarities or differences? And what she found was that academics knew what they were doing, but they didn't know how to put it into words very well. And so she ha she ended up having focus groups and saying what's unacceptable, what's acceptable, and what's outstanding, and then people would give her a bunch of words. So you're looking, when you read this list, at the tonality of it more than it as a checklist. So if the tonality is that there are sections that are poorly written, uh, maybe the paragraphs have more than one point, maybe they it was, you got tired that night, you just didn't do as good a job of that section. Um, uh, you didn't edit something very well and you have some spelling and grammatical errors, especially if your document is going to be handed to somebody electronically. You really want to have spelling and grammatical errors taken care of because now most of us have tools that show those things up in different colors. Um, uh, we, uh, for instance, um, I know of a student recently who was preparing for his Viva, and uh, the, his editor did not use the tool turned on in Word that marks, is the little paragraph mark. I hope you all write with that little paragraph mark on. It keeps your spacing even, et cetera. And so there were extra spaces in between, but when he turned it on, in his machine, all those extra spaces turned green or blue or something. Uh, that's the kind of thing you want to avoid, and you, it's, you're totally under your control, because you want to be able to hand this document to somebody who can open it up in any reader and not see something that makes them suddenly get hypercritical. 
your goal is to keep everybody away from the hypercritical end of the spectrum. So nothing that's sloppy, nothing where an error will show. Um, if you have a content reader and they really know your field, be hypersensitive to whether or not the way you use words is similar to some other expert out there because they may wonder if you've plagiarized it or um, if they know the sources as well as you know the sources, be sure that you are citing them correctly and that you haven't misread or misused something. Uh, if you have people reading that aren't in your field, you probably won't run in so much of that one. Let's, um, I'm sure all of you understand your basic concepts. However, theory may or may not be done well. And it may be missing because you may have some people who didn't set you up well to think about theory. So uh, it's a it's a sticky one. I've seen otherwise decent arguments didn't do theory well, didn't pass, or pass with lots of review comments. Um, and heaven help you if somebody on your committee of feels that your analysis is confused or inappropriate. Um, another question that will be really unfortunate, but I've seen it happen, is if you've done a lot of work, but your whoever was helping you get there didn't really push you on the significance of your work, and you have somebody on your committee who's really looking for a high level of significant um, ad addiction, or additions to your field. So those are the kinds of things that tweak the box in their head, something is wrong here, and once they start going after what is wrong, it's, it's, or do we look at these documents where the cup half is half empty or half full? Um, it, you want to keep your committee away from the half empty idea, uh, and then you'll be fine. So then, then, now that I've been a little scary, let me talk about what's acceptable. Because you're going to see that this list is really pretty much a C plus B minus level. It's workmanlike. It demonstrates technical competence. It shows the ability to do research. It's not particularly original or significant, but there's some of each. Um, it's not all that interesting, exciting, or surprising. But it's, that might have a moment. Uh, it is absolutely coherent. Uh, you haven't, uh, you haven't waffled in your analysis. We can understand why you got there. Your writing might be a little pedestrian or plod along. Your structure and organization are on target, but they really aren't very exciting. Um, but you know what? I say these things to you, but this is from the point of view of somebody who has read a lot of these. And it really doesn't matter at the end of the day if you are in this stage because it is acceptable and you will graduate. <laughs> and your committee will, they might not leave going, whoa, that was wonderful, but they're going to pass you. You're going to go on with your life. You're going to have this degree over. And, and that's really when it's much more important about how exciting you are. Still, those of us who look at the doctoral work around the world are a little concerned that right now, as a phase, doctoral students are not as innovative as we would like to see. People aren't taking big risks in their um, research. They're, in fact, being more acceptable, more workable. Uh, perhaps they might have elegant research designs, but the questions they're going after aren't the risky questions. Uh, so these are the kinds of overarching things um, that we look at. Um, you know, as long as you make a small contribution, you do it well, you're coherent, your quality is workmanlike, uh, you have, you should be fine. So um, now let's talk about this because we're going to come back to this later. And it's my belief, after working with hundreds of doctoral students, that almost all of you have something, some aspect of what you do that is on your list. Excuse me for 
clicking my fingers, but my dog was trying to go somewhere he shouldn't be going. Um, I, uh, all of you have something going on in your uh, document that really is one of these characteristics. So we're going to come back to this, and at the end of today, the there's an exercise that helps you focus on that and uh, with the idea that this is where you want to make sure you go, especially in your slide presentation. So what makes for outstanding? These people who had done a lot of these would use these terms. Original and significant. Ambitious. Brilliant. Clear. Clever. Coherent. Compelling. Concise. Creative. Elegant. Engaging. Exciting. Interesting. Insightful. Persuasive. Sophisticated surprising and thoughtful. Now, probably you're not all of those, but you can be several of those. Very well written and organized. Synthetic and interdisciplinary. Connects components in a seamless way. Exhibits mature, independent thinking. Has a point of view and a strong, confident, independent, and authoritative voice asks new questions, or addresses an important question or problem, clearly states the problem, why it's important, displays a deep understanding of a massive amount of complicated literature, exhibits command and authority over the material. Argument is focused, logical, rigorous, and sustained, has theoretically sophisticated, is theoretically sophisticated, shows a deep understanding of theory. I hope you're all just kind of eyes closed taking this in because you want these these really are you. You just need to consistently bring it up to a few of these. Has a brilliant research design, uses or develops new tools, methods, approaches or types, has rich data from multiple sources. Analysis is comprehensive, complete, sophisticated and convincing, results are significant, or failure is significant. It doesn't have to be a positive result by any means. You can fail massively and still have a great outcome. Conclusion ties the whole thing together, is publishable in top tier journals, is of interest to the larger community, changes the way people think, and pushes the discipline's boundaries and opens up new areas for research. Um, fantastic, huh? When this is this is when we think about where we want to go when we're newbies. This is where, and I think it's useful throughout your career if you're working in any kind of an academic setting to every so often pull out this list and make it what you shoot for. Um, and you will be a thought leader in your field, and you will make a significant contribution over time. Before I go into this, let me just catch up on the chat. Thursday. OK, Manuel's going to do it on Thursday, so you can come back on Tuesday, and you can practice your questions. Um, always remember to check off spelling exceptions for field-specific terminology and author's name. That's a very good, useful hint, Adrian. Do you have suggestions, insights about how the committee evaluates? Uh, maybe attend other people, talk to your chair, and possibly review this list. Um, the how it evaluates is I'm going to go into next, David. These First, I'll take you through what has to be there from even a basic um, list of examination standards. And then we'll talk about the variance that I see in, mo in some places. And uh, another thing you can do, just pragmatically, you can look up your committee members in ProQuest dissertations under the field that is the advisor's field. And you can see what other work they have been instrumental 
in getting published and in a, a doctoral thesis or dissertation level. And you'll know a little bit more about what probably you can analyze that. You can critically analyze it and maybe get a good sense of who will be asking what kinds of questions. It doesn't, at the end of the day, even matter if you're right or not. Just the exercise of doing that will put you on more solid ground for the defense. Uh, talk to your chair absolutely and absolutely review this list. I hope it's that useful. Um, there are, uh, Adrian's right, there are defense and also look up VIVA evaluation criteria. Don't just be U.S. centric. And uh, actually, I would go to Google Scholar and look up how dissertations or theses are evaluated. Because within our scope of research, more than what the universities will put out and what you'll get in Google, but in Scholar, you'll get those writings like Barbara Lovitz and other people who have researched how people do this. Um, I use a phrase called the golden thread. We talk about that a lot, having a, your consistent, coherent thought process throughout your document. And that actually comes from a rubric from the South American uh, evaluation team. So attending other defenses at your institution. Now, you're lucky if you can, Jane. Most institutions that I'm familiar with, a defense would not be something that you could uh, see. Closed doors, Adrian agrees. Um, originality, logicality, coherence. Um, those coherence, 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 and I mean finite word for word coherence. Uh, what we what we see most in those that have a lot of challenges uh, when they come to us for editing or coaching or whatever are that they started writing the document at one period of time in their life, they ended the document at another period of time in their life. Their thoughts have matured throughout the document, and from the first to the end, the language is not coherent. The ideas are different. Um, is anybody else having difficulty with sound, or is this Alicia's sound problem? I'll check on that. Tell me, anybody, good sound, bad sound? Could be I got a little far away from the mic. Okay. All right. Um, Alicia, I'm going to think that it might be your connection, but remember, this is recorded, and you can always come back and watch it there, too. Okay. Okay, and good to see you again. Uh, now, next step. As I said, in current internal consistency, know your golden threads. So within this document, these are the expectations we see, and I remind you that this is an art form. It is not a roadmap. So you have to have all these things on this list. They have to go together well, but they might go together well in different forms. So uh, they might be that you or university asks you to write chapters one, two, and three, and then you have manuscripts to write, journal articles to write after that. Uh, and they have to have all these components in them. So what this list is, is kind of a down and dirty, everything in research needs to have it all. All right? So I'm going to take it like that. Introduction um, needs to introduce the problem and the significance of the problem to us. So in most cases, it's going to have a problem statement. And as soon as you give us a heading that is problem statement, you would better know the rules for what is a problem statement. It's two paragraphs. It has, it's very particular. Uh, and if you're not sure, go to the doctoral net site and, and when it, whichever site you sign into and um, go to your search and look up problem statement. You'll get a lot of things, a checklist, et cetera. But it's a particular thing. Uh, research questions are particular. 
And if they're qualitative, they're different than if they're quantitative. And if they're quantitative, we generally would expect to see hypotheses. Um, we need to know kind of why you're doing this. Now, not maybe why you're doing this, but why it's important that it's done. But also it could be why you're doing it personally. Uh, and then the context in which you're going to be studying it. Um, and a, a quick little introduction to where we're going and how we're going to get there. So in other words, when I finish your first component, your first chapter, I'm, I need to know what my roadmap is and what I'm going to expect. And this can be done in all kinds of ways. Now, I'll tell you now that as an examiner, I read your table of contents in detail before I ever read a word of your document. Because your table of contents lets me see to the extent that you are following a normal pattern or an abnormal pattern. And then I begin, if it's abnormal, that's great. I don't mind having two chapters for the second, for the lit review, whatever it is. Uh, five chapters for your finding, whatever. But I want to know, I want to be able to have it clearly shown to me why that is. And so your headings and your tables of contents should do that. If you give your reader, as some people do, a very, like, very, very trimmed back table of contents, um, you, for the kind of reader I am, will give me so many questions. I will be more, I will be harder on looking at what you do than if your headings and your table of contents take me through. I make a lot of judgments. And I'll kind of read it with that judgment in mind. Now, I'm not everybody, but I do this a lot. And so that's a system that works for me. And if you do it well, it's a system that can work for you, too. Then you have your lit review. It's a review. It needs to be comprehensive. It needs to be up to date. You might have done your lit four years before you actually finished. You better have your lit up to date. Uh, it shows a command of, of the field. Um, as it relates to your topic, it might show me how other fields also relate to your topic. Remember that one of the outstanding things was the ability to synthesize a wide range of information. Uh, you show a command of it. You talk about literature easily, like these people are your friends and this is what they told you. Uh, and how all their thoughts go together and how they've been synthesized into your thoughts. It gives me a sense of the context of the problem as a field, as an academic field, perhaps the context of the problem from a pragmatic viewpoint as well. But why does this matter, especially if you're doing something that has social significance? Uh, in the, uh, includes a discussion, um, and they these words, selective, synthetic, analytic, thematic, in other words, you aren't telling me everything in the kitchen sink. You're only telling me what I need to know to understand your study. So that you have, you've done the work for me. You don't give me all the work to do myself in your review of literature. Uh, component three is the methodology and it includes theory. Um, it may be theory in the literature review. It may be theory, theory made. What does theory drive in your study? Does it drive what you did or does it drive how you think about what you did or both? Uh, and so where you put it, how you talk about it, these are your decisions to help your reader understand. And they have to be logical. And if you understand them well, and if they align with your questions, you'll be fine. Uh, and your methodological choices, I want to be convinced that you made good choices. I'm not expecting you to be a tier one researcher. and But I'll notice if you are a tier one researcher. So use good models and uh, discuss your methodology well. Component for the uh, uh, that is the method um, is that here is how it worked. I don't. I so uh, this. So your methodology chapter, if you're in the United States and you had a three chapter proposal, 
your methodology chapter in your proposal might be quite different from your methodology chapter in your final because things happen and you made choices. So you're writing up what actually happened, why it happened, how you made your choices, et cetera. Uh, and then you roll into your results and uh, uh, results that are analyzed, but not, you haven't come to any conclusion. I think that what is often chapter four, it's component five here, may be the hardest thing for most beginning researchers to write because you have a lot of ideas. You, you're answering the questions as you go through your analysis, but you don't get to answer the questions here. You get just to tell us how things stack up under those questions. So it's a tough nut. Um, it has to be appropriate. It has to align. This is the part that you really do need to rely on content specific people for. And so that you can rise to the bar of sophistication. We also need to see that you've done some work on it, that the work was iterative, that you went, that your ideas evolved, they emerged. How did that work? Um, so your voice wants to show the person underneath the data. Uh, and it's presented as cogently and concisely as your field allows. So qualitative, we would expect to be a lot more writing than quantitative. Quantitative, we would expect you to have really good tables and be able to discuss what's in those tables cogently. At some point, your study has limitations. Know what they are. Know what you should have done, you could have done. Uh, and get them in there. And this is like a secret that my committee chair gave to me that I'll pass on to you. If you do a good job of your limitations and delimiters, this is what I didn't study and why I didn't study it as a delimiter, and this is the limitations of what I did do, you put them in well, and then your committee and defense or VIVA cannot discuss them. They can't, you've taken it, what he tells me, his phrase was, you've taken it off the table. Limiters and limitations and uh, take them off your table. Don't let these people um, have at the things you already know are stuff you would do differently if you were to do it again. Or that were natural limitations because of you, your time, your space, and other constraints, natural constraints. Uh, and then you have to discuss it, and I remind you that whatever your final chapter is, it may be the only chapter that some people read after this is published. So make it good. Make it your voice. Make it count for something. Make it your entree into your field at a different level. If your final chapter and discussion is exciting and cogent and concise and synthetic and all those things, we're going to like, we, the examiners, are going to like your study a lot more. If it is dull and you are tired, you will pass. Dull and tired still pass. But um, so try to write your final chapter when you're rested and give, hopefully, in your drive to the end, uh, you didn't run out of time and you you could put it away for a while and come back to it when you had your passion back amongst you. Um, and Adrian points out that these are necessary ingredients, but every cook approaches it differently and has a different set of skills and levels. She's pinned that, but this is the structure that examiners examine for. So you have to do these things. How you do them, how much the way you do them, that's the art form part. But if you get all of these and they're well done, your document is worthy, you will pass and you will become Dr. Whoever, and then, then you can fly. Okay, questions before we go into a few tools. Okay, and good to see you've been busy writing. 
Does anybody, I'll put it this way. Do you have a question? If you have a question, raise your hand. It's underneath your box. And I'll wait. If I don't see hands go up, I'll move on. Going once, going twice. No hands? Okay. Tools. These are some really good basic things people may forget, and they are on every doctoral net portal, whether it's for from your university or the live site for individuals. Um, there are a set of self-assessment tools. We call them automations. They are, at the end of each one is a series of criteria. Criteria for your topic, for your research questions, for your sample, for your population, for your problem, for your problem statement, uh, and for how all of those fit together for your literature. When you're at the end stage and you've got, it's, it's useful if you have the time to finish it, give it a week or so, and analyze it. Go back to the beginning tools. Go back to these self-assessments. Read the criteria and analyze your document about whether or not it pins those criteria. And then decide if it's not included, do you want to include it and why? Another thing is to go to the search. Sign on to any of our portals. Upper right hand corner is your account. Drop down from the account is the search and search on the word checklist. And you'll get a lot of them because I like checklists. I write to checklists. I, I self-analyze to checklists. So uh, there will be several. Pull them down and check off your work. And then finally, when you're going into the event itself, go to phase three, phase two and phase three, both end with a preparation for defense set of articles, et cetera. And Spend a little time going through your setup for the experience. Now, we'll do more of that next week, but um, it's useful because it may be six months from now that you're actually going to be going through this experience. So go back and, and review those items. It preps you. You wouldn't, if you were an athlete, you wouldn't go into a, um, a final game of a season uh, a game that had a cup in, involved to it and you wouldn't, and you didn't work out beforehand. You wouldn't do that. Uh, you would know your scores. You would come in prepared. So, uh, the doctoral net portals have a lot of things that help you prepare. Now, ready for an exercise? I, in, when I do this in front of a live group, You, but I will be doing this live next week. When I do this in front of a live group, we have this particular exercise makes people just come alive. Um, this lady reminds us that you have two sets of um, rubber bands around you, uh, uh, constraints on you as you move forward, and this is true. Constraint of where you've been, and it's that's like the rubber band is pulling you back, trying to hold you in place. And then you have the forward motion of where you want to go, and that's your dreams and your visions and the prep work you've done on getting you there, etc. And that's the part that helps move you forward. So um, we're going to do this exercise, and it's going to be a forward moving part. Okay, everybody, prepare to write. So here's the here is the um, question. This is the set of outstanding um, criteria. These are these are things that we you would want your document to be. For today, just choose one and tell all of us how your document is that. Convince us. If you say your argument is focused, logical, rigorous, and sustained, that's a good sentence. Now tell us in what way it is focused, logical, rigorous, and sustained. 
And here's the bottom line for this exercise. Take this exercise very seriously. Because in order to be in the winning circle, you need to play to your strengths. So you want to know from this list what is your strength and then play to it when you set up your slides for your final. So they leave knowing what you were strong in. They may not have read your document the way you intended it to be read. So I'll give everybody a few minutes. Type away. Make sure you do this for yourself. And it'll help everybody else to have you, but it'll feel really good. Even if you're not there yet. What are you shooting for and how do you intend to get there? Andrea, I didn't see you come in. Thank, glad you're here. Elena, nice to see you. I think you and I have had some conversation uh, via email. It's always good to put uh, webinar attendees into um, context with other things that we do. Uh, for those of you who did come in later, this is recorded. Uh, it's the first of two. And the slides will be up in um, Big Marker has a handout section under the chat, people, poll, question and answer, and handout. And I will put these there for you to be able to refer to. Because these are a set of slides you will want to. But in the meantime, whether you're new or not, um, I would ask you to pick some one of these and say, my study is going to be this. Or it is this, and here's how, here's the way, it, I'm, you know, here's the best part of it. Feels really good to see yourself in the winning circle this way. If we were in a room together, I'd have you turn to each other, have a conversation. And the level of volume in the room would go way up. Joe, good to see you. Joseph, good to see you. A lot of you guys came in when I was talking. Debadada. So Adrian's is theoretically sophisticated. In fact, having had the pleasure of working with her, it is so theoretically sophisticated that getting it right in words has been a challenge. But when she gets that completely down, it will wow people. Manal, original contribution. Filling a gap in the literature and also adding practical contributions to the field. So um, really when you're doing your slides, get passionate about the passionate practical contributions to the field. It's okay to be passionate about our work. Andrea asks new questions or addresses an important question or problem. My research seeks to answer uh a decades long question do black women who use long acting reasons escape poverty whoa that's an amazing question good for you public health expert here we come jane offers an innovative and contemporary approach in addressing issues of educational opportunity excellent doesn't it feel good to write these things? So how are you? Think to yourself, Manal, next week you're doing this. 
think to yourself, how are my slides going to highlight my original contribution? How are they going to highlight the gap? And how are they going to highlight the practical contributions? And how am I going to tie those things together so that when I finish speaking, they come and you're playing to your strengths? Uh, Vina says, my work is on ethical issues faced by forensic doctors in disasters. Ooh, very big. I'm working on an interface of ethics and forensics. As forensics doctors, we deal with the dead. The moment a person dies, specifically in disasters, when there are hordes of bodies, what ethical principles come into the picture? Since there is not much, so much literature on living people, but absolutely no discussion about ethical principles applicable to dead, my study is original, significant, engaging, and thoughtful. I would say thought-provoking as well. Um, and uh, so I highlight the fact that since when you are that, when you are original and significant, really play to the fact that you're making your readers think as they go along. Um, Debadada says exhibits command and authority over the material. Yes, it clearly states the problem. Um, Joe says my why it's important. They jump a little. Um, pushes the discipline's boundaries and opens up new areas for research services. A demographic never covered in a scholarly sense in biblical studies. Wonderful. Um, I avoid to talk my topic as I thought it is general. You know, uh, you have to play to your strengths. And so you want to take us from whatever the seeds are. Your seed may be a general topic. It's the seed. Grow the tree and then tell us about the tree. Um, okay, and my research develops new approaches to education as it offers lenses that expand, a lens that expands from preschool to college and beyond. It's a P21 perspective that is intersectional and offers principles that engage major stakeholders in the process. Really excellent. And I'm going to bet just from the way you wrote that, that you are exhibiting command and authority over your material. So you've got it. It's been a really good day. This is the most important thing. Um, I just want to say what's up with the rest of Dr. Olnet, and I'll show you what we're doing next week on this subject. I have to tell you that if you have been here too long, and the Lingerers group today, I think it's going to be quite exciting. We're talking about how to speed up some of the processes of lit, lit um, bibliography, references, literature writing, can be kind of a slow and murky part of this process. We're going to talk about some speeding it up things. But if you haven't scanned all the webinars for the quarter, you might want to do that. Um, spaces are filling up. We have a limit on the number of spaces. And just because people are here doesn't mean that they aren't signed up. And at some point, we're looking at the place where some of these will get capped. So do yourself a favor. Go look now at what's going to be the ones you want this quarter and make sure you've got your space. Uh, May, remember that we are beginning, this is the season now where we're going to push on you to think about what you're going to do this summer. Summer is this awful time period at the end. So many doctoral candidates come back disappointed that they didn't get as much done as they wanted to get done. It's completely um, under your control. And so you're going to watch for emails according to the phase you're in or the year you're in. Um, and we're thinking and planning ahead. And then we do that in every, in every phase with tools and tracks and analysis, et cetera. So that's up for what's happening at Doctoral Net. Um, next term, next time we're going to focus on backwards mapping to graduation and part two is talking about how to backwards map the whole rest of the process, uh, what your slides should look like, what questions you need to be prepared, what a mock defense will do for you, et cetera, and you can answer all your questions. 
Um, <laughs> Kayan says, I'm going to graduate. That's what I'm going to be doing for this summer. Last leg. Congratulations. When any of you graduate, please let us know. Please send us pictures. We have a wall of fame around here. It helps us remember all the reasons that we do all this work. Um, and webinars on establishing and sustaining right outlines. Okay, so I'm copying Adrian's suggestion, and we are going to bring it into the next. Lingerers group. Lingerers is a good group, and so actually, I might uh, we might bring it in to read this and comment. We have two really good groups going on, um, and you don't have to attend in person. Although if you attend in person, they meet, they do a lot more for you, and uh, we talk about very significant parts of making this work work. Excellent, Manal. I was happy you came and happy to share with you. I hope to see you next week. Um, thank you. Uh, everybody, quickly, scale of one to five, how would you rate today? Wonderful. So today's a good one. We do this. I have to say practice does make perfect. We do this twice a year. We do this this time of year, and we'll do it again in November for those of you who are graduating in December. You will have a chance to uh, to come up with it again uh, because it's an evergreen topic, uh, and we really, really, really um, appreciate it. And Adrian wants those slides, so I'll go put them up right now. Every I'm going to close off the recording for those of you that were watching. I hope it was good for you as well. And everybody, I hope to see you here next week. Tell your friends.